Short, bald, and angry. My dreams, my dreams, my dreams. You sometimes dreams, find that dreams, dreams get in the dreams, way of your dream. Get out of here. Dreams, dreams blocking dreams. Am I saying everybody else? Dreams preventing my dreams from dreaming. Get out of here, Baldy. He called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. God. Then two she-bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the boys. <laughs> I'm a shooter, goddammit. Cross me again, I'll put a bullet through your head! Not that kind of shooter. I'm a peace-loving shooter. A cameraman. I might appear to be short, bald, and angry on the outside, but I assure you I am tall, happy, and handsome on the inside. I am a walking contradiction. Let's get this thing started. In three, two, one. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to episode 3 of the Short, Bald, and Angry podcast. My name is Ian Cinco, and my guest today is Tara McManus. Tara is a powerhouse of a woman who doesn't take no for an answer. She's part of a crew of fire people in, fi in a fire family here in New York City, and she's personally responsible for changing the landscape of how fire can be both performed and practiced here in New York City. She's a fire eater, a fire performer, and a fire producer a role that she created along with Flambeau. She's also polyamorous. She's also an artist and a fashion designer. And she's also my friend. She's not just a fire safety expert. She's been helping the FDNY and other institutions across the country rewrite, and in some cases, write from scratch, new codes and safety guidelines. She has a Class E27 Certificate of Fitness, which means she's a licensed pyrotechnic apprentice and is working on getting her E18 Class A pyrotechnician license, which would enable her to blow up cars for TV and film. How cool is that? She's founder of Third Earth Fireproof, which is her clothing line that specializes in making fire-resistant clothing. She's co-founder of the Floasis, a flow art school, and the first ever place in New York City where you can practice and teach fire legally. This is a relatively new thing, first of its kind. She made history with the Floasis. The Floasis is running an Indiegogo campaign so they can start a nonprofit called Combustion Inc. Combustion will help expand their ability to empower the fire community in New York City. It will sponsor permits for small shows and help with the bureaucracy and equipment that prevents fire artists from bringing you their art. By doing this, they are going to empower indie fire performers in New York City to perform more often and in more venues and at less cost to the artist. And it will all be done more safely. Combustion will also have community service and outreach aspects to the fire arts and education, uh, in Tara's own words, edutainment. So whether you're an entertainer looking to level up the quality of your show with some fire, or someone who likes to enjoy the nightlife of New York City, consider supporting them through their Indiegogo campaign. And that link is in the description of wherever you are getting this podcast. So shout outs to my new Patreon members. First up is Dre Torres, a.k.a. Shadi. Dre jumped in at the $1 level. Thank you so much, man. Dre is uh, soon to be a guest on the show. I recently completed a job for him uh, and his creative partner, Tev, Alex Valdez. They both hired me to make a little, a little something that I can't wait to share. I take great pride in all my artwork, but uh, the art I made them is something extra special to me, and it's uh, super close to my heart. I don't think I'm allowed to talk about it yet, but, but keep your eyes peeled for it. Next up is... Uh, Professor Andrew Lennigan, he, uh, he likes to go by Andy, and Andy is an amazing painter. His, uh, his paintings blow my mind. They're, uh, they're plein air and usually have a, a fisheye effect, and, and they're just stunning. He does a lot of Brooklyn and New York landscapes uh, and all times of the year. This guy goes out in all manners of weather. All for, it doesn't matter what, what it's like outside. Um, he gets it done. And I always want to go out and join him, but my life has been uh, pretty hectic and I haven't been able to prioritize going out to make art in the streets. But I, I predict that's all going to be changing soon. As I, uh, as I location scout for a film and shoot some research shots for a comic I'm going to be drawing, I plan to also take some time to stop and make some drawings around the city of the city. Uh, Andy was my professor freshman year at Pratt. He taught me how to wield the primary colors like a pro, among other things. I've always, uh, I've always, I've always loved his pragmatic approach to art. 
I also thoroughly enjoy his Instagram feed, where he shares mostly political but occasional personal anecdotes from his man cave, a.k.a. his garage. Uh, if, if, if you love impressionistic paintings and landscapes, uh, you should follow him at Andrew Lenigan. That's A-N-D-R-E-W-L-E-N-A-G-H-A-N. And I look forward to having him on the show as well. He agreed to come on. So thank you, Professor, and I look forward to talking to you soon. Uh, now, now for the fundraiser portion of the intro. As I've stated in previous episodes, I need your support. Consider donating to my Patreon. The link is in the description. I'm trying to make enough money from this so I can say no to more jobs that do not satisfy the creative urge within. If enough people support me here, I'll be able to put more effort and time into the jobs that I love doing, and I'll also it will also enable me to make more of my own personal work. You don't have to donate a lot. You can jump in at the $1 level, the numero uno. You'll receive a shout-out. Also, you'll have early exclusive access to my patron-only feed, although I'm still not sure how I feel about the patron-only feed. Let me know if you think I should do it or not. For $2, you become a mega deuce. I'll send you a sticker or two. If you're making a healthy or even a disposable income, consider donating more than $2, though. For $3, I'll call you a magic donor, because they say 3 is a magic number. Your comments on my posts may be picked as the subject of my next piece of content, plus all previous rewards. At the $5 tier, you become part of Club Cinco. As an honorary member of Studio Cinco, you will join me for a segment on this podcast to discuss a topic of your choosing. Or, if you're shy, I can mail you a custom drawing instead. Plus, all previous rewards. This tier is currently being held by my friend Christine Kane Stevens. You should join her. Join her in that in that that tier. There's also a one hundred dollar tier, and you can customize your donation as well. You want to? I don't know if fifty. I don't know if you can do fifty cents, but give it a try. Or maybe maybe try ten dollars. I don't know. Just get creative with your your donations. So thank you to all my new patrons, and please consider joining the crew. Help me build. Help me grow. I just spent about $300 on audio gear to bring up the production value of this podcast, and hopefully to make my life a little easier in the process. I'm having a lot of fun doing this thing, and I want to make sure it keeps getting better as I go. And all guests on the podcast get a free photo chat portrait, like the thumbnail of wherever you're watching this. If you're watching this on YouTube, you're watching me make a photo chat of today's guest, Tara. If you're interested in coming on the podcast, reach out to me at ian.studiosinko at gmail.com and that link is also in the description. And I want to throw out one more special thanks to uh, the dump across the street from my apartment for providing ambient street noise in this episode. What would a New York City podcast be without the sound of the loud city streets? So thank you to the dump. And without further ado, I give you Tara McManus. And uh, come, come a little closer just so we're uh, all talking to this. I lost the foam thing. <laughs> this works. <laughs> Very cute. <clears throat> uh, getting started is always the hard part, but I'm gonna. I'll, I'll have an introduction, so I don't need to introduce you right now. We can just kind of like dive in. Okay. So uh, I was gonna say, uh, do you even remember how we met, or do you know how we met? I remember. Uh, you, we had to like jog each other's memory, but I remember uh, you coming by the fashion studios at Pratt. Oh, you do? It, yeah, like, but not immediately. Like, mm-hmm. I, I think when I saw you at Bazaar Bar, I was like, you seem you seem really familiar. Right. But I think it was maybe, like, the second or third time that we met that was like, oh, you went to Pratt, you went to Pratt, oh, I dated somebody in fashion, and I'm like, oh, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, we definitely, we didn't know each other back then at all. I was, uh, I was starting to write that film that I'm not, I'm not naming, right, we're not naming it yet, and, uh. <laughs> And I was talking to Chris Carr. I was like, you know, I want to meet some fire people because I was really afraid of the fire element. It scared me. It's like, I know it's really dangerous. I don't want to hurt anybody. So like, do you know any fire people? And he was like, yeah. So he introduced me to Stacy Spectacular. <laughs> and Stacy was like, you have to talk to Flambeau, Sage, Cinder, and like, and Tara. Tara is the fire mama. <laughs> so I was like, Tara McManus. That, why does that name sound kind of familiar? And then, yeah, and then I went to Bazaar. And there you were. I was like, oh, shit. I totally know who this person is. This legendary person in the fire world. Yeah. Well, we've been in Brooklyn for, I mean, it's been 18 years. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, well, I was class. When you say we, you mean like 
Because you Both were, of us? yeah, two th- thousand. I got there two thousand. Graduated two thousand four. Yeah, yeah. So eighteen years. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, I don't really. Th- I like my home. I go home to where I grew up, and I, I feel like this is all, Brooklyn's more of my home now because yeah. I don't recognize half of my home. Yeah, but I don't reckon. I like. I'll go away for a month and come back and not recognize my neighborhood. But that's just gentrification. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's everywhere. It's inevitable. <laughs> it doesn't matter where you live. It's going to change. Yeah. Um. All right. So. So I mean, who the who the hell are you, Tara? You're a uh, you're uh, you're a fire person, but but you're a fire eater, right? Mm, yeah. You do fire fans. Fire eating, fire fans. You know, depending on who I'm performing for, I can spin anything. Mm-hmm. If I'm performing mm-hmm. for what we call a Muggle audience, which is a Harry Potter reference. Yeah, Harry Potter reference. Some some people think that's a mean term, but I I love it. I love calling muggles muggles. Call a muggle a muggle, a spade a spade, right? Yeah, it just it just means that like <laughs> it's nicer than calling somebody basic. Yeah, or like people, some musicians call the audience rubes, and I'm like, okay, right. that means you're ch- like a rube is somebody that you're ch- cheating out of money or something. And this is like we are the people on stage making magic, and I we're literally making magic. Yeah, and they're the people who should be mystified by the magic, right? Like, and they shouldn't know. Yeah. My tricks. Right. So I think muggle is a good term. Like, it's not an insult either, because, like, also, in, like, if you go Harry Potter by the book, like, they're protecting the muggles. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, they're just, that's their name. It's just, that's just what they are. We're not making fun of anybody. If you're a muggle, you're a muggle. It's yeah. All right. I mean, Voldemort was, like, all evil, and he wanted to kill all muggles and mudbloods. Right. And, you right. know. Right. We're, we're entertaining muggles. We're not killing muggles. Right. And Hermione. We're not is- robbing you either. Hermione is half muggle, and she's the best wizard ever. So. True. There we go. Yeah. So. Uh, so, yeah, if I'm performing for total muggles, I will spin pretty much any prop. Uh, if I'm performing for other flow artists, I would say that I am a fire eater. I spin fire fans. Those are my primary use props. I'm a mediocre poise spinner. I'm a mediocre... A decent to mediocre double staff spinner. I am an absolute basic staff spinner, but I can, I you know, I can you move say my you're body. You're a muggle level staff spinner. I like slightly above. Like, like I can entertain a muggle with with a single <laughs> staff, not contact staff. Yeah. I'm a shit juggler. Like if someone looks at me, I drop. There's that. Uh, there's so much to go over here about who you are, but let's stick with the fire for now. You, you're a co-founder of the Floasis. Mm-hmm. But it's but it's like what what's the deal with the Floasis? Where's the Floasis at right now? What is it right. to begin with? No, we are still a location. We might not always be a location because uh, New York City real estate is a bitch. Um, yeah. But we'll be a location until next July, so we got a year. Yeah. Uh, and we've been a location for seven years, and it's a spot for fire performers to come and practice uh, and learn. We are DIY <laughs> space school, so teachers. Um, use the space, they let themselves in, they clean up after themselves, they they donate a portion of what they make to the space. If they don't make any money, we don't make any money, and we're just here to support them. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we have multiple ways of supporting it. There are resident artists. There's a gift shop called Flow Juggle, and my clothing line is there, which is Third Earth Fireproof. I was going to say that. Yeah, and, uh, and the Flow Asis is also known as, like, a group of people also known as kind of a service like we just did a show last week and you know all of our safeties are running around in flow aces t-shirts so we kind of we leave the limits of that one location quite a bit and that's well yeah i mean the original reason why you set it up was because fire in new york was illegal like you weren't allowed to practice fire anywhere right? yeah that was the, the catch-22 if you wanted to do fire you, yeah. could, you couldn't legally do it anywhere in New York. You could do a show. You could get a permit, and that's four hundred and twenty dollars. And the irony was that you told you taught me all this. Everything I say here is something Tara taught me. <laughs> is that you're expected to learn how to do it on stage while you're performing? Yeah. When I asked the inspectors like where are people supposed to practice, they he they would either say like you'd have to get a permit to practice, or like I don't know, I don't care, don't talk to me about it. Like right. they would want plausible deniability. They. Uh, before 2015, they didn't want to really acknowledge it. Um, and around 2015, the mayor and the, started a whole 
campaign for quality of life, which created a lot of bullshit. A lot of people getting tickets for spitting on the sidewalk and racial yeah. profiling and bullshit. Uh, Was that Bloom- and Bloomberg? Yeah, it was Bloomberg, and the commissioner was tasked with dealing with the fire performers who were practicing in parks and, like, may or may not get tickets. It was really a gray area, Mm -hmm. Uh, and the FDNY back then would only permit fire on Broadway, in Broadway plays, and then they started permitting uh, Webster Hall, which they considered to be... Because it actually was, at one point, like an opera house and a uh, ballroom. So they considered Webster Hall to be kind of part of that. And um, th- through work of Flambeau, he pretty much just wore them down to start giving permits on other places. Um, until the commissioner was like, actually, you have to do something about the fire performers. And luckily, there was a lot of turnover in the explosives unit. And they decided, instead of just shutting everybody down, to to license it and regulate it. Yeah. So Flambeau brought me in and was like, you know, talk to her. She 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 understands the science behind it. And I brought them all the... The FDNY. Yeah. Yeah, so you've been working with the FDNY a ton. Yeah, yeah, they're my buddies. Yeah. The explosives unit, at least. You know, <laughs> I can't speak for every everyone in the department. It's the biggest fire department in the country. And, we're, and aren't you helping, you're helping, like, write, what are you, what are you helping write, code? Not laws, but Basically, like fire, helping update fire codes. And yeah, right, the study material for the license. Right. Um, so I worked with a woman in the office who, uh, she does all of the study materials for all the certificates of fitness, which there are hundreds. Yeah. So, uh, like, the fire performers fall under E licenses, where E29, E28, that stands for explosive. And that there's the E10, which is, like, dynamite high explosives if you're blasting foundations or subway lines you need to be a licensed pyrotechnician that's going to be the grand finale for a floasis present show someday yeah just blow it up when we move out yeah (laughs) we'll just put some charges (laughs) you know then there's like e18 is a class a pyrotechnician and with that kind of license you could do like blowing up cars for tv and film or uh, class B is the E19. The E20 is for fireworks. Yeah. Uh, E27 is the pyrotechnic apprentice. Nice. So I have the E27 and I have the E20 working on my, hopefully my E18 by the end of the month. Um, you're working in a pretty male-dominated field, uh, right? Yeah. All your posts, on, you put a lot of posts on Facebook about it that are usually pretty funny, sometimes <laughs> a little disheartening, but... Yeah. Um, yeah, I, so I, I work for one company that does fireworks and they have 400 technicians. Uh, they all work on 4th of July. Then a lot of them, that's it. They they only work on 4th of July. Then there are the guys that they bring back more and more. I've met two other women Mm -hmm. on the job. I've never... Are they higher up? Are they in charge at all? no. No. One of them is, she's a boss. I don't know if she's a captain but she's all definitely like calling orders. I mean, they, I've been on a lot of jobs recently, and by a lot, I mean like every job I've had. I feel like in the last three years, every the boss are they're always women. The boss is always a woman. Yeah, she's well, she's a serious boss, whoever she is. Yeah, I think that like I don't want to get too binary about like the genders and what they're better at, but right. I do see that women are better at delegating and like kind of seeing the bigger picture and dividing up tasks and it's funny because with this fireworks company like they're they don't really divide up tasks like the truck shows up they roll up the gate and everyone just starts like unloading and like half the time we unload to the wrong place and then spend another hour like moving it somewhere else and like everyone just kind of like dives into the boxes and just starts doing stuff and we need to hire more women yeah yeah Put them in charge it it kind you know at the end of the day they get the work done right but there's always like people stepping on each other's toes and uh I they the company doesn't do many proximity jobs and I just started doing proximity what's proximity that's like indoor fireworks that okay. we can do on stage while there are performers on stage and that's the work I really want to do and um that work I realized it it takes someone delegating and my last gig um. Like, my boss was completely, like, 
kind of fighting with the venue about where to put speakers versus where we could put fireworks. And he's like, uh, he could just tell that I was like, all right, guys, like, we all, first we need to assemble these things, then we need to strap the fireworks to it. And, like, he's like, you, uh, just tell them what to do, and I'll be back. And I'm like, I'm just in my first year. and Yeah. <laughs> but I, you know, and I'm, I can't always lift the, the heaviest box, and I may not know, like, some things about wiring, but in terms of just, like, taking a look at the bigger picture and being like, you do this, you do that. Like, I, I see women falling into that role more often you, am i wrong in saying you've had a lot of really kind of like amazing gigs in the last year like things that like a year ago when i saw you i feel like you were in a down moment you're like oh, i'm never i can't get i can't get these jobs and then i feel like on facebook i'm seeing like you're working on the opera yeah the opera that sage was on yeah yeah i've been in the opera for three years now and they'll bring me in just Usually one show a season mm. has a fire performer. Okay. And where I've been stuck is I'm kind of like at the top of the ceiling as a fire performer, a fire producer. Fire producer is a new job that me and Flambeau created. So no one's out there like, oh, we really need a producer on this. Like if a production has a lot of fire performers and they're not licensed, they call the FDNY and the FDNY will say like, you need a producer. But th there's never going to be a listing in a newspaper like seeking full-time fire producer how many producers are there now like they're all your people right yeah mostly i think we've got about six or seven do you know of anyone who's like not in the circle who's who's become a fire producer um well when me and flambeau started you need two producer recommendations to become a producer and okay. so the fdoi said you can't we can't just have two yeah otherwise you guys could just never give out a recommendation and take all the work yeah um, so we recommended our first two people, Claire Deluxe, who I would consider like in our circle. Yeah. Uh, and I've never the, met her, but I know a lot about her. Yeah. She's my fire mama. Yeah. So she's, she's a big deal. And, um, and she runs the Enchanted Troop and it just made sense because she has a troop of like eight fire spinners mm -hmm. and no one was licensed. So, cause it just came out. It was right. Like, get Claire her license so her eight people can work under her until they get their own licenses. And uh, the other person was um, the general manager at Coney Island, USA. And Who's so uh, Patrick, oh God, I'm gonna, I don't want to say his last name wrong. That's all right. Yeah. Um, so he's, you know, Sideshow is kind of a different scene from Flow Arts and right. Burning Man and all that. And but, they, but they definitely use fire. Yeah, they do. So he's got the producer license. And we've got a few out of state people because um, a fire producer can recommend fire performers. And f there are fire performers who are in like Chicago, DC, uh, those areas that might want to send their people to New York to get licensed or to perform in New York. So we've given out a couple out of state uh, producer licenses. But we don't need too many, that many producers. Right. I'm not just saying that because I want all the work. Uh, it's just, it's pretty easy to get your performer license. Yeah. And the producer just gets to oversee other people. Yeah. And there's a whole other skill set. It's not just about being a good fire performer. Like, it, I don't give a shit if you can spin poi really well. Yeah. As a producer, you need to tell performers no. You know, you yeah. have to be ready to be like, I'm sorry, that's not safe. You can't do that. And, you know, that's really what I look for in a producer candidate. Because at the end of the day, we are talking about people's lives. This shit is incredibly, incredibly dangerous, right? Yeah. I, I wrote down the, the stats. Like, I learned about the Station Nightclub fire <laughs> in Rhode Island from you and, and Stacy Spectacular, uh, where, where 100, 100 people died. 230 people were injured and then there was the ghost ship recently in Oakland 36 people died yeah it's no joke it's horrific it's literally like the most hellish way I could think of dying second only to maybe drowning you know it's like yeah absolutely yeah. horrible and, and you die not necessarily from burning you die from suffocating right totally yeah if you while, while you burn yeah if you die in a burning venue you know you're slowly asphyxiating if you die in a burn unit you're even suffocating usually um, because if there are burns around um, your neck or even over your chest, it causes so much swelling that it will just close up, 
close up your pa- air passages. Yeah. And that also goes for if you have burns fully around a limb, you could lose the limb because it'll swell so much that you lose circulation. And the whole time that you're going through skin grafts, which is usually what they'll do for burn victims, it is excruciating. You're growing new skin. So anytime a, a burn victim comes into the ER, they immediately get put on um, like methadone or you know, uh, very high, highly addicting painkillers, which is already a risk. If you survive, right. then you might end up with a painkiller addiction. Right. And During then... the opi- opioid ed- epidemic. Yeah, totally. And they put burn victims in chemically induced comas so that you can be knocked unconscious the whole time you're growing <clears> your <throat> skin. So a lot of burn victims, you know, there's a fire and they wake up a month later and they have new skin. Yeah. So that's terrifying. And a lot of people don't make it through the chemically induced coma. Hmm. So uh, it's... It's definitely Tra- the most. It's like the most traumatic thing you can think of. Like if you're going to survive something, it's it's up there. It's like top five most traumatic things you could survive. I think probably. Probably yeah, I mean I had a partner who was trying to console me when I was panicking about starting my, the job at uh, doing special effects with Harry Potter, and he was like, well, what's the worst thing that could happen? And I'm like, the worst thing that can happen is I could kill a Tony Award winning right. actor <laughs> slowly. Like they would... Which actor are we talking about? <laughs> well, there's, uh, I mean, a few of them get in the way of the flame projectors and right. I'm the one pushing the buttons. <laughs> <laughs> like... Yeah, I didn't like him in that last movie. Let's get rid of him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're all Broadway actors from London. They're all incredible. I definitely would No, we're talking about Broadway actors. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um... But it, it's like the worst that could happen is really like they end up in the hospital and they die there weeks later after slowly swelling and trying to grow new skin and maybe rejecting the skin. It's like it's it's terrible. Yeah. Um, it's not like, you know, accidentally hitting the wrong key when you're programming. Yeah. No. I mean, you're, you're really passionate about this stuff and it like it will get into the art side of it and the, the entertainment side of it. But. But yeah, it's it's no joke. You've you've made you've carved out. You're you're super influential. Like people people have all heard of you, and they have to go through it in some way because, but you you haven't just you're not just making these these things up for no reason. You're say, you're going to save people's lives in the long run, and at the same time, you're making you're making it possible for people to do more fire. Yeah. So you're you're really opening you're opening doors, and, and you're making it safe. And I think a lot of people should, in, in the end, be grateful for it. Yeah, totally. And I, I'm known in our scene f- and within fire performers yeah. for sure. And, you know, now I'm entering the world of pyrotechnics and no one knows my name and right. like my That's contribution. And it's just like, what's this girl doing here? <laughs> so I think it's really frustrating, like being in my 30s and being told like, well, I need to apprentice and yeah. like getting a lot of mansplanations and <laughs> and straight up sexism and yeah. harassment. It's been an issue. Definitely dealt with a lot of abuse of power. Yeah. And uh, women are facing this everywhere. And for me, like, I am dedicated to the safety of the people in the audience. And, yeah. like, it's just everything else is bullshit. <laughs> totally. Everything else is so needless. It's a tough position to put yourself in, but you, you're you're fearless. You just go right at it. You're like, this needs to be done and I'm going to do it. Yeah. It's admirable. Yeah, I know, I know, I know kind of, I don't know what it's like to do it on your level, but I know what it's like to be the, the one who's like, we can't do this. This isn't safe. Calm down. Yeah. So, uh, be the buzzkill. Yeah. But, uh, nobody wants to get hurt. Nobody wants to see anybody get hurt. Um, so, uh, let's, let's maybe, let's skip to what, what are we promoting today? What, what's going on in the world of the Floasis and Combustion, right? Yes. So, Combustion Incorporated, uh, we recently just filed, uh, with the state, so we have an incorporation, and our next step is to, uh, file, uh, non-profit status, and it's going to take about a thousand dollars in lawyer fees, and it, about a year to get through the IRS and we'll come out with a 501c3 status. Mm -hmm. Combustion Incorporated is going to be the service that the Floasis has been kind of acting as. Um, And we want to go above and beyond that. Mm -hmm. So 
basically in New York City, like I was saying, permits are $420. It's really prohibitive for artists who just have a vision and want to put it on stage to come up with that money, especially when you're not paying yourself, you're not paying your safeties, you're not paying your performers, you're buying fuel. And, you know, venues uh, are going to charge you, like, up to $1,000 just to staff the sound and light people. Yeah. Um, so that adds up fast. Totally. You end up just spending money to put your art out there. And um, so... It's not like being a painter or in, I draw with a lot of ink. It's not the same thing at all. Yeah. <laughs> One show, you're going to go broke. It's crazy. Yeah. And um, so nonprofits actually get free permits. So that was really the big motivator to start Combustion. Cool. Um, but beyond just working around a loophole, it's more about uh, taking the arts and education work that we already do and making it more public and turning it into a community service and helping out artists. So we're not going to be getting free permits mm -hmm. to do big gala shows at, you know, at big events uh, or corporate sponsored things. We're not going to be doing like Red Bull Presents, whatever. Like when there's a corporate sponsor, then we're going to charge, you know, charge the client for the permit. But when it's an independent artist who just wants to go to like Bizarre Bar, Lot 45 or Super Fine and just get up on stage and, and do something, we can be there to help them. And we also need to make sure they're doing it safely. Um, so, like, another motivator for this is that I keep meeting up-and-coming fire artists who come through the Floasis, and they do everything the right way. They, they try and be safe, but they get invited to <coughs> perform at illegal parties, and there's no way that I can go to a warehouse party that's illegal where they don't have a liquor license and they don't have an assembly permit and bring in the explosives unit and say, oh, we're going to do a legal fire show here. Yeah. So these illegal parties get up and coming fire artists to work for free or for 50 bucks. A lot of fire performers will totally perform just for the opportunity to get in front of an audience. Yeah. And I understand that completely. And professionals are really angry about being undercut. And I always argue to the big, the big names in fire performing that like when these artists do these little shows they're not taking away from your like big gala money yeah. because they're doing something at a you know a warehouse or that yeah, wouldn't yeah. be your gig anyway i totally agree with that i feel like that applies to all industries where everybody everybody's up, uptight and anxious and or angry about people undercutting them and stuff yeah and like undercutting is real and i've definitely had people take my clients yeah i turn around and i'm like hey it's that time of year again you're gonna hire me oh no we're it hiring. is it is real but um but I, I agree with what you're saying though it's like There's, most the, the kids performing illegally at these parties aren't taking anything away from anyone else yeah there are but just, what are they doing <laughs> there are gigs that like the higher names wouldn't take and they're never going to be able to afford to yeah. pay a performer five hundred dollars and i do believe that when you are up and coming you shouldn't make all that money and right. like yeah. you kind of get what you pay for so you, you gotta learn you're still learning yeah an audience time is so valuable as a performer. Yeah. Uh, a good florist is going to put in like hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of hours honing in that skill of juggling or hula hooping or whatever. To knock your socks off. Yeah, but they also have to put that many hours into audience presentation. Mm -hmm. You don't get audience presentation when you're, you know, in your studio performing for yourself, even right. in front of a mirror. So I think it's really important for up-and-coming fire artists to get that audience time to learn how to engage the audience, make eye contact, smile, yeah. deliver, um, and I just want them to do it legally. I don't want them to resort to warehouse parties and things like that because, you know, the ghost ship fire wasn't because of fire performances, but it was the kind of space where... That would happen. Yeah. yeah where like a lot of up and coming fire performers Would end go. up in spaces like that. Yeah. So I want to give people more opportunities that we could go to like small cabaret stages mm -hmm. and do little showcases and it could be a five, $10 cover and performers could walk away with 50 bucks, 
but what's really priceless is that the FDNY inspectors will be there. They'll shake hands. They meet the people. They see them. They see their career grow. And it really is about like having a good relationship with those inspectors and, and learning from them, you know, um, they're, they're really great. If they just don't like the, what they see on stage after the show, they'll approach me, the producer to approach the performer, like, Hey, tell them to make sure that they're spinning like into the wings and not straight in the audience. And they, they don't come running out to shut down the show, but they give advice and it's all really valuable. Yeah. The so he's growing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I am responsible for creating hundreds of new fire performers. Yeah. And I also have to be responsible for the liability of what they're doing when and where. And, um, and for them to like actually have opportunities because right now they're like m- at most five venues yeah. that we have well, like written consent from that we can legally do fire at and there are hundreds of fire performers. Yeah. So new venues is a big deal, which is why permits are a big deal. And it's so tricky. You were just talking about we we don't we don't need to mention who or what, but it's like the venues can lose their permits if they're not careful and then every it's just like it's so easy to just slide back. And mm-hmm. if one person does something really wrong, it messes up everything for everybody, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we all have to hold each other accountable. Um I have, (laughs) there is not a fire performer in New York that I haven't had a stern talking to. (laughs) And like one day I just like posted on Facebook, like, have I ever yelled at you? And I got all these answers like, yeah, and you were right. And like, you know, and I said like, what have I yelled at you about? And it was like this or that, or, you know. Which is funny because I think my experience meeting you, I think a lot of people, it's like, you're really nice. You're super nice. You know, you're really unassuming even, I would say, and like chill and you can talk about anything and you're happy and... But yeah, you you have this other side where when it comes down to, to go time, you better be doing it right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've been, I mean, everyone gets short with each other in production mode. It's like, yeah. you go there now. Like, no, please, thank you. Just I love it. I, I kind of, <laughs> I love that. Like, I know production can stress people out and scare them, but I like, I like how it's not about feelings. It's like, let's get this done as quickly as possible. I, I like, I don't like over explaining things. I love when it's like, we're almost on an ESP level and we already know it needs to be done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just and like you there go. <laughs> like, exactly. Like just, just straightforward. Yeah. And then, you know, like I f- have been to a lot of up and coming fire shows where I write an email to the producer and I bullet point every single person that performed and some things that I saw maybe backstage or on stage that needs to be worked on. And, you know, I think everyone's is better for it. And, you know, I'm glad you think I'm approachable. Some people think I'm a total bitch. It just depends on how much you fuck up, really. Yeah, I mean, I've I've <laughs> never I've I've seen you maybe get a little like angry, but I can't imagine anyone thinking you're an actual bitch, but Mm-hmm. Maybe that those are the people who are doing shit really wrong. We probably yeah. think that. Um, but what do I know? I don't know. <laughs> uh, so so yeah, this this uh, this this fundraiser you're doing it's for combustion to uh, increase the the potential for all kinds of fire artists to perform in the city. So really, it's in everybody's best interest to donate. Yeah. And there's an Indiegogo link will definitely be in the bio or the, yeah. Yeah, the description of wherever this is. So, yeah, and so, you know, $1,000 of that is filing our, um, just for the nonprofit. Once we have a nonprofit, we have to do our taxes quarterly. You said and, you're aiming for $5,000. That's too low, I think. We need to we need to get her more money than this. Yeah. The team. It's not just for Tara. This is for the team. Yeah, yeah. I got uh, Lydia Brooks and Claire Deluxe on my uh, board. Yeah. And, um, you know, we're going we're going to need a legit accountant because when you have a nonprofit, you right. really have to be on top of it unless you're Trump Foundation. And then you can <laughs> do whatever the fuck you want. Uh, but have you thought about partnering with Trump? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm like, uh, I can't make any threats. Yeah, we so got to be careful just... about what we got to say or we don't. I don't know. I'm open to we can make fun of him if we want on the show. Yeah, we can make fun of him. for he, sure. He's asking for it. Yeah. Well, we weren't even. um there was a p- potential uh, fire show we were going to do called Kill It With Fire. And the main reason that we never did it was uh, we couldn't afford permits. Yeah. Uh, but uh, a friend, uh, Caitlin Bird, who's an awesome uh, poi and rope dart spinner, we had a whole meeting about it. We whiteboarded the crap out of everything. And m- our biggest issue was 
finding a venue and then our next issue is going to be affording the permit um so yeah there's definitely it would be great to be doing political satire with fire and it's oh yeah it's just like i have some ideas yeah we all know there really isn't much money in it so it's like we can't also pay out of pocket Mm -hmm. for the permits when is when is this fundraiser over oh we got about a month okay less than a month i think we have three weeks okay and so you know the other thing that we need on we're gonna need an accountant we're gonna need a grant writer and if we actually have grant money yeah one of the things i want to do is provide insurance for up-and-coming performers because it's the, uh, the next barrier to entry that i see with up-and-coming fire performers is i get them a show they're ready to go and then you know everyone needs their own insurance policy and they can't do it Mm. So that's something I would like to do with grant money. And I also want to bring more public entertainment and education, edutainment. Edutainment. I, yeah. I want to go to schools and do fire shows where we explain the fire triangle, fire circle, the actual dangers of fire. Oh, that'd and, be great. And do a fire show for them. That's an awesome idea. Yeah. It really, I could see that working. Really gets things into people's heads. You like you like making your life really complicated. Yeah, I know. You don't I, like doing anything easy. No, <laughs> I know. And it's like, I also don't want kids to be like, what I learned today was fire is really cool. <laughs> right. And to go home and do it. So that's something I'm still trying to get my head around. How do I make it? Yeah, work? I mean, what kid, you're talking about middle schools? Because that sounds like a risky proposition. College is... That would work. That sounds really cool to me. Yeah. I yeah. could see middle school being a lot of red, red flags because those kids are insane. Yeah. Myself included when I was that old. Yeah. I met, you know, I have um, someone who took my class who teaches uh, science workshops with fire. And uh, they do they do things. It's just, it's not like really handheld fire props, but right. they'll like trap fumes in a, in a big barrel. Work in the scientific angle. Yeah, so I want to like cool. work with groups like that and um, and like do it all legally and <clears throat> keep the entertainment in there. So yeah, between that and then also we usually do a big show in the park. We do a big free public fire show, and we did it in Maria Hernandez Park last year. And I want to do it again. Um, I'm so sorry I missed that. That's the park I <sighs> I throw the frisbee. With Luna, my dog, at it every day, and I missed that show. Oh. It was really sad. I really wanted to be there. Have you seen the beautiful Vimeo video that we have? I think so, yeah. Yeah, we had drone footage of it. Oh, it was beautiful. I think and, I was out of town. Yeah, and it was it was really great because Maria Hernandez Park is in the backyard of the Floesis pretty much, but it's also, I mean, it's a park that has a lot of cool programming, but uh, not much live <laughs> entertainment and a lot right. of... You know, people in the neighborhood were like, wow, I've, I've never seen anything like this. I thought stuff like this only happened in Manhattan. <laughs> um, so No, all the cool shit's out in Brooklyn. Yeah, it's true. And um, I'm, I'm debating on doing it during Bushwick Open Studios. Oh, definitely. Yeah. What's the debate? Well, Brook- Bushwick Open Studios is for the gentrifiers. Right. Um, and you want to keep it, keep it for the people who li- like, actually live in the area? Yeah, I like doing it for the for the original community which yeah. is mostly like hispanic families and so we did all the emceeing bilingually um last time we were in maria hernandez and um the other thing is like um the parks they don't allow you to ask for tips yeah if you get um a special events permit mm-hmm. so if you we're doing a show like that we need permits and that's about a thousand dollars um, we can get the FDNY one for free when we have our nonprofit, but there's still... So you can't get, you can't throw a tip out out when you do that? Nope. It's kind of a bummer. Yeah. So we spend about $1,000 and there's no way to make it back. What's the, th- what's the reasoning behind that? Uh, if we're making money, the parks wants it. <laughs> uh, how, about, how about a cut? Why do they got to take all of it? That ain't right. The alternative is that we um, call it a corporate event. And if we call it a corporate event, the fees go up to like three or four thousand. And the bureaucracy of this humanity is disgusting sometimes. Yeah, if you hang a banner for a sponsor, then you have to pay another two thousand. So annoying. So for us to hang banners, we have to make two thousand off of that corporate sponsor. 
And we have friends at House of Yes who are like, we can get you liquor sponsorship, but it's like, we can't, we can't give out liquor in the park. Oh yeah, of course not. <laughs> so that would be fun though. That would be so much fun, right? Oh yeah. There's, there's, where we I mean, where do you go? You gotta go to like festivals. That's like the dream place, right? That's why festivals are so loved, and that's why fire spinning is so big at festivals, right? Yeah, but it doesn't pay. It doesn't pay. They don't pay. But you can drink, and you can do drugs, and you can have fun. Oh yeah, yeah, you can do all that. <laughs> and you can put out a tip hat. Yeah. I know not house. I know not uh, Burning Man, but like. Uh, other festivals? Yeah. And I, you know, I quickly learned as a performer that um, I get paid better as a producer. And, like, I, I, I'm very suited for it. So, for me, production has been where the money's at, especially working with festivals. Because you have five stages. You want to have five performers on all stages. I'll bring you five fuel cabinets. Yeah. 10 CO2 extinguishers, 5 ABC extinguishers. You've had some like, funny posts where you're talking about you're parking your van full <laughs> of explosive and fi- flammable <laughs> material around the city in precarious places. And yeah. Like, if only if only a cop would roll by right now, they'd be like, what the hell? Yeah, yeah. Are you, what are you doing? My plates say flammable. Yeah. <laughs> or it's, there's no vowels, so it's like That's the actual, that's your actual plate. It's like, my, van, my vanity nice. plate. Nice. I haven't like, seen that. Yeah. That's funny. They, the fire department. You got flammable. F M. Well, I guess I shouldn't give out my license plate number, but it's flammable without the vowels. All right, let's not give it away. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and I have an <laughs> FDMY sticker right next to it, and like sometimes when I'm like parked at shows, they'll be like, "What?" And then they're like, "Oh, it's you." Mm-hmm. <laughs> Making a name for yourself. Yeah. But you know, even with festivals um, like Gratitude Migration, we brought out an entire team of safeties. And you know, three stages worth of equipment, and uh, we regulated all the fire performers. I'm gonna and give you a little shout out right now. I've I've had the privilege of shooting several of your fire safety classes and several of your other classes too, and I've been tra- I've been trained in some things. I didn't just shoot them; I got to put the camera down and do it. And I highly recommend anybody who wants to get into this, get in touch with Tower. Just go to the Floasis, check it out. Oh, let's let's shout out like a spin jam. Spin oh, jams yeah. and things spin like that. Like, what's going on at the We've Floasis got, these days? Uh, Sundays are uh, circus jam. So we've got a juggler who kind of heads that up. And he, Martin? Martin, yeah. Martin. He is a fucking badass Call, unicycler. Call, Caldwell? Caldwell? Yeah, Caldwell. Martin Caldwell. Yeah. And he's a great unicycler and juggler. And a lot of the folks who come out on Sundays are, they tend to be more jugglers. They want to pass clubs together. Right. It's a great opportunity for jugglers who are good at what they do, who want to pass fire clubs. Add the element of fire into yeah. your juggling routine. Yeah. And, uh, and then you'll see the usual suspects of like all Floyd's jams, people spinning all kinds of fire props. But you'll see more traditional like Diablo, Rollabolo. I forget, did you know Matt Gazzardo at Pratt? He started like that ginormous juggling oh, thing. It yeah. like it started small and then it turned into like like he filled up the ARC, that gigantic gym gymnasium yeah, full of yeah. jugglers from around the world. They're totally... world class jugglers coming through. Yeah, yeah. There you know, in New York City there are juggle jams seven days a week. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. Um, I mean, everything you want is always ready for you in New York City. You just need to know how to find it and where, you know. Totally. To yeah, and then, you know, the Floasis is the only place you can do it on fire. Right. And then Tuesday is our our jam that uh, we've been doing for the whole seven years we've been running. And it goes from 8 to 11 o'clock at night. We run over past 11, but we don't want people coming straggling in right. after 11 otherwise you got neighbors yeah and there's a suggested donation you got to fill a little waiver form and you get to spin uh, yeah in a safe environment if you're new to it there's usually people around who are willing to kind of take you under their wing and yeah and help you, you you don't have to do fire we get a lot of hoopers who are like right. oh i don't go because i don't do fire and you can totally come and spin your props not on fire you can yeah. do the hoop use your sock poi use an led and hang out with like-minded people and practice cool things yeah yeah it's a really nice like half hang out half spin kind of thing i there i i'm nostalgic for it even though i feel like i'm new to it all it's like because i learned how to breathe fire there i was shooting mm-hmm. flambeau mm-hmm. taught his master class at your at, at the floasis yeah and again i wasn't even planning on learning i was like i'm just gonna shoot this because i'm gonna get you know in, the inside scoop and then before I knew it, 
Someone <laughs> someone made me put the camera down and I was learning how to breathe fire. Yeah. So like yeah. I could I could cry thinking about it. It's so emotional thinking about it. Really, it was a really big. I didn't even realize it was, I, that wasn't like a dream of mine to breathe fire. That wasn't even a goal. I didn't realize how deeply it was going to impact. You know. Yeah. Me. It's fire breathing is an experience. It's just a like blast yeah. of fire out of your face. Right. You're not so into it, right? You're. No, you're I'm kind of. I'm of the fire eating school of thought. There are some people that do both. Sage, she's fucking badass. Sage is a total badass. Yeah. Um, but most people pick one or the other because their fire eating and fire breathing are the two most dangerous fire arts. Right. In my opinion. Yeah. So I went with fire eating. Yeah. I still like. I probably should do a fire breath at some point because people are just shocked. That I haven't yeah. breathed. No, you got. I think it's smart to do what you're comfortable doing. Right. I no mean, reason to push yourself. Really. It's true. I've done. Unless, unless there's a reason that you have that you want to push yourself. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm. I'm glad you did that. Yeah. It's, me too. Everyone should have <laughs> that so kind of cool. like. And it was so great. I mean, everybody was cheering. I felt so like welcomed and like I had a new family. It was. It was really lovely. Totally. I love it. The fire family. Yeah. I mean, that's another big thing about the Floasis. It's a community. It's a safe space. Yeah, I had that community. <laughs> I was like, we got to talk about the community Bullet aspect. Bullet point. It's fantastic. It's yeah. really it's beautiful. Yeah, we really... Um, it's New York City and people come and go. So yeah. we've been around for seven years and like Warren is... Warren's saying he's my man. He's like... One of the his him and me are the longest running people at the Floasis, and it's it's you know he's a rock. He's super solid. He's always there. Oh yeah, yeah. I he is my first pick for fire safety for every gig. Yeah. For whenever I need like a, someone by my side to help me, like he's that guy you can always count on. Yeah, and you know we've had a lot of great people come and go, but I love when people come back to town yeah because it's new york city you're gonna come back we do a big uh spins giving the night before spins-giving. yeah the night before thanksgiving i think this year we're gonna do it the tuesday before thanksgiving because the hangover has ruined my thanksgiving <laughs> yeah that's <laughs> that's bad turkey yeah. turkey with a hangover oh, uh, man. man i can't even get and, to and family yeah family i can't sh- i don't know about you family sh- I don't want to talk shit about my family. I love them, but family stresses you out a little bit. Mm-hmm. To have a hangover on top of it, that's a no. bad recipe. And then drive out to Long Island, all that. So we're probably going to do it Tuesday, but I love seeing all those faces yeah. uh, who come back and we share a meal. And then maybe after eating, digesting, <laughs> we'll spin fire. But, you know, um, we also do like an ugly sweater party every year. Like, I hate ugly sweaters. Oh, my God. It's just <laughs> something about me when I see myself in a picture with an ugly sweater. It's like, I don't know what it is. I have a hang-up. I just can't, I can't get down with it. It's I, so bad I it's feel good. so shitty. <laughs> I know. Yeah. It's so bad it's good. Totally. And um, we do a pumpkin poi for Halloween. We make fun. little jack-o'-lanterns, and we attach them to poi. We attach them to other props. And they don't fall off? They don't spin off when you they're very durable and eventually they do fall off but they're never flaming because they're so juicy like they can't really ignite they're just filled with so much moisture Um, oh that's interesting so we end up catapulting like smushy uh sooty pumpkin across the backyard by the time it's over um let's go back in time a little bit uh like to when you were a kid and let's talk about some art and stuff because you went to Pratt we we went to Pratt at the, the same time we didn't know each other but uh yeah like what 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 were you like as a kid you weren't doing fire as a kid were you or not artfully not artfully <laughs> I was burning things for me sure. too yeah yeah I mean that's so much fun um you know my my dad totally encouraged it I grew up in a house that was heated by uh burning wood Nice. So I love that. And we went camping every weekend. My dad was a tractor trailer driver, so when I say camping, we had a camper. Nice. Like, we didn't tent camp, um, but you know, out on Long Island, it was a just like, home. yeah. I mean, we lived a five minute drive from a campground, so we would go. Oh, that's perfect. There's would, no excuse then. Yeah. yeah. Hook up the trailer to the pickup truck and like your backyard. go out to the beach and camp out on beach the... Beach camping. Yeah. That's a dream. Oh, it's great. And, like, 
my my dad would be grilling and be like, oh, we forgot ketchup, and my mom could drive home and get the ketchup. Like, it was it was so easy. And so, of course, we'd have a where, fire. Where was this? Uh, out on eastern Long Island, like, okay. just, just west of the Hamptons. Like, you Why know, did I not realize you grew up out there? That's crazy. I dropped the accent when I got to college. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is like officially the third time I sat down for this type of podcast interview type thing. And I didn't realize you grew up on Long Island. Yeah, yeah. Um, or maybe I did. Maybe I, my memories. Yeah. Me. Doesn't really come up. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so fire was, you know, we cooked food over the open flames. Yeah. We had this awesome cast iron sandwich maker mm-hmm. on a, a stick. Those things are awesome. Yeah. And we made, when my family made s'mores, it was like inside bread. Like mountain pie s'mores things? Yes. With like butter, butter both sides. Butter? And yeah, and we would make grilled cheeses. So it was like sweet and savory. Yeah, and and then the house was heated with the wood burning stove. And my dad would be like, "Oh, check this out!" and throw a handful of metal shavings in and it would change all these colors. And then he's like, "That's a magical effect." Yeah, that's that's where you got a little bit of a taste for it. Science huh? magic. And then he would say like, "Oh, that's really toxic, by the way." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's fine. And he. I mean, what happens when you when you throw that stuff in there? What? How toxic is it? It's like it's creating smoke or, or a uh, fume in the air that's going to get in your nose and. Yeah, yeah. You're you're creating whatever metal you're throwing in there, like iron oxide, mm-hmm. sulfur oxide. All of that can cause uh, like welder's lung. Mm. Um, it's not good for you for sure. So just do it and step back. Right? Yeah, don't, is that don't safe? It. Or is it like? What's it's about prolonged exposure because yeah. it builds up in your system. Right. So, so if you're not doing it every day, you should be fine. Yeah, totally. Cool. Yeah. And it'll, it depends on the fuel you're burning in combination with with what you're burning. and um, Ventilation is key. Yeah. So don't stand over it and huff it. Don't do it in a closed space. Probably shouldn't have been doing it in the fireplace in the house. Right. <laughs> that should have been just outside in the fire pit. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, I mean, and my, my dad also would get empty plastic containers, like bleach containers for some reason. They, they were the best for this. We would go to um, basketball courts and hang it to the basketball ring. There was, like, there was no net on them. They were just, you know, bare bones. Tie it up there and set it on fire. And then when the melting plastic pours down, it goes... Pew, 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 it makes pew, sound pew. Effect, huh? Yeah, so that was like our ghetto fireworks because you, we you know we there are no fireworks for sale in New York, so that's how we made our own DIY. Yeah, 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 and then you know by the time I was twelve, my dad taught me to weld, so I was doing stick welding, and sometimes we would rent like an acetylene tank and do some like cutting and brazing and stuff since I was a teenager. So that you know, that's my introduction to fire and then I got into fire performing actually after my dad passed away uh and I always think he would get a kick out of it now yeah um so I mean if if he were alive today he would be definitely like home welding things for me to set on fire are you spiritual do you believe he's looking down on you I do and I don't you know yeah I go back and forth I don't know what I believe I I believe it's smarter it makes sense to sort of be like, I don't know. <laughs> and I think realistically, too, like, that sounds like a boring existence if you were just watching the people that are alive. Right. Like, I hope If you get onto another plane, are you really going to stick around? Or are you going to go check out some far out interdimensional astral shit and get, get out there, right? Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I hope that his consciousness is carrying on yeah. doing things. And, like, I am a, I'm a, I'm a believer in dreams and 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 visions and and uh things that come through dmt trips Mm -hmm. (laughs) as that they are connected to the afterlife yeah so i i think that you know consciousness can go on and that you can visit people in, in their dreams and maybe in real life too but also like can do all this cool kind of like dmt realm stuff Mm. Uh, that's what I hope. I, I do think that he sees what I'm up to these days and is proud. Nice. I, like, you know, I drive like a 20 foot long truck and set things on fire. Like, he'd definitely be proud. Yeah, you're a total badass. He would be very proud. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't put up with any shit, so. No. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. So you were, uh, so, so how'd you, what brought you to Pratt? Like what made you, what got you into fashion? Uh, I used to just like make my own clothes and people would be like, wow, you should go to school for that. And yeah. they're like, oh, you should make your own clothes. And when I got to school for fashion, I was like, this is a horrible fit for me. <laughs> and like every semester I thought about switching to industrial design but my family didn't have much money and I got in on like all these scholarships and everything and and I got in on a fashion portfolio and I like it seemed like changing majors would cost too much uh but the whole time I was there I was kind of fantasizing about industrial design but I had a teacher who was really great um Kelly Horgan yay and uh she was like oh my partner is in this circus called Circus Amok and it's a queer radical political satire circus super awesome yeah so when i found that i was like yes this is what i want to do i want to do puppetry i want to do circus costumes yeah and all that so um i got on that path and that was before you graduated yeah yeah because i i do remember seeing your stuff at the fashion show the senior fashion show and thinking damn that's awesome yeah it was, it was, you had a good show i had two stilt walkers one yeah. on two legs and one on four legs i had a little person and then i had a runway model yeah. <laughs> who was terrified the runway model was terrified <laughs> she was just like totally <laughs> weirded out by what found she... a way to make the model feel out of place at the, at the fashion show yeah <laughs> she's like afraid the stilt walkers are gonna fall on her and completely weirded out by what she had to wear and it was great it was awesome yeah. you made her life better whether she was aware of it or not yeah and it was it was a lot of like uh first time for pratt to ever have stilt walkers on stage was it yeah no one had ever done that before yeah i had i got rejected to do it initially wow you had to fight for your right to still walk yeah yeah they were all worried about liability so yeah then the president of the fashion department actually like had a meeting with i forget who it was at what department it was like the bursar no i don't know all those all that collegiate bureaucracy yeah. but we got through it so yeah then you got it let's let's just quickly get it catch up so then you got out of college you did you did fashion for a living for a while right? i did that was horrible yeah we don't need to go over all of it but I, you told me in depth some of that stuff it was just stupid yeah <laughs> so then where where'd the fire like actually really spring up um, or, or burn up festival you just started going to festivals yeah I, I, you know i started going to rubylod parties rubylod that's my backyard now oh yeah 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 back when they were on class and yeah that's and when i first learned about them they were having these crazy ragers i just met the the woman who is like one of the founding members of that oh sorry yeah yeah i love her and her husband chris and their adorable daughter oh my god yeah um and yeah i guess it was probably Ruby Lod or, you know, right by Pratt, there used to be the um, Happy Robot and some hoopers live there. And I actually didn't get into hooping. Funny thing is, is like many years later, got into hooping and then I got to know everybody like uh, Brent and Malcolm and Michelle and Waylon. I used to see them walk around campus with hoops in college. And I just, it's funny because like, they're my people now and i'm mm -hmm. like how did i not know they're my people like, well i wasn't hooping yet yeah. um so but yeah so i was going to happy robot parties ruby Lod parties then decompression and then uh found out about burning man and going to pex fest and other festivals i saw fire performing at third ward for one of the first times and I really actually got drawn into fire performing when I saw spin jams, not stage shows. Not the performances. Yeah. Because spin jams, like, people are taking turns, patting each other on the back, here, all safety for you, you want to go, oh, you want to, like, spin together, and everything is improvisational, and everything was, like, about the camaraderie, and then I was like, I want to be with them. Yeah. That's when I knew it. Yeah. Shout out that spin jam again on Tuesdays. Yeah. <laughs> what time is it? it starts at what? Uh, 8 to 11. 8 to 11. Spin jams at the Floasis. Really great people. That's Sexy, cool. sweaty, city people. I'm trying to think if there's any other things that we could say about the fire getting you to where you are right now. I mean, you were you were still designing uh, clothing. You did fire 
fire, not fireproof clothing, but fire resistant clothing, yeah. right? Yeah, my clothing line is called Third Earth Fireproof, but fireproof. It's still around. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I'm only really making sleeves and duvetines, but I have a lot of back stock and I'm just trying to sell through it right now. Um, I got ahead of myself with like, well, I need to offer every color in the rainbow and every size in the spectrum. And the next thing you know, you have like 500 things. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, the Floys just used to be the studio and it was it was packed. Like, yeah, totally. It's still kind of packed. At the Floys or where you live now? I am moving all of my equipment into my uh, one bedroom apartment now. That's why I got a, a one bedroom with a living room so that I can have basically my living room is like half studio. Yeah. Um, but I've, I've really scaled it down on, on that end. I'm really focusing on um, being a pyrotechnician now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know. Maybe you'll come back to it someday. It's cool that you have it still. Yeah. I almost sold my machines and then I just like, I was like, I can't do it. Don't. So. I don't think you should. I feel like, I mean, if if you can, if what my experience has been is worth anything, it's like I've I've dropped so many things over the years, and every time I come back to them, I'm like, don't drop this ever again. And my yeah. goal right now is to synthesize everything, but that's easier said than done. Totally. Uh, and, and this podcast is gonna definitely complicate my life even more, having to edit the podcast together. But, but yeah, I wanna I wanna do I wanna figure out a way to jam it all together. It's like you, yeah yeah we'll see. we'll see. I mean, I forgot I used to do art. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, I oh, mean, yeah, I was an artist. Yeah. <laughs> I like, got so into the fire world. Uh, totally. Like, before Pratt, I was so into academic drawing. Like, I haven't seen any of those. You're an academic draftswoman, huh? Yeah, yeah. It's all hanging up in my mom's place. Nice. Yeah. Um, I, I miss figure drawing, and it was so interesting because academic drawing is about realistic drawing and then i went yeah. to school for fashion and they were like exaggerate that shit yeah make people nine heads tall i like i like fashion drawings that aren't so st like they're like a hybrid between like a real classical drawing and and a fashion drawing you know yeah i i really like stylized fashion drawings that just like really have a lot of character but i never yeah. got mine down and uh, right now I'm doing a mural in my, my new apartment, so I'm excited. Cool. Yeah, it's a big hamsa, big protection from the evil eye over my front door. Awesome. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, like, unpacked all my sculptures and was like, oh, I used to cast resin. Like, forgot I used to do that. Ha I have all my dad's, well, not all of them, but a bunch of my dad's sculptures, so I'm putting them all out on display and, like, kind of nice. remembering myself. You ever think about getting out of the city? Seems like you, you could be the type of person who could benefit from maybe living nearby, but having a bigger space and a backyard. And Yeah. Well, before the licensing came out, I was hell-bent on leaving the city because yeah. it's too damn expensive. But now you've gotten to a place where you're, you like where you got it, huh? Yeah. Once I, I got the license and I was the first person to get a producer license and the fire department put out a list that says, like, from now on, if you have a fire performer, they need to be licensed and no one's licensed yet or they need to be monitored by a licensed producer and there's only one person right now like once that list went out and i got hired by the opera and st anne's warehouse and um the park avenue armory and broadway theaters i was like well now i'm making new york money i can afford new york rent and i'm still struggling with the freelance mm -hmm. thing even working on broadway i am a substitute and you a know, substitute a uh, pyrotechnician right, okay. for special effects. Yeah. So I don't know when I'll get the next call for work. Yeah. I know I have Me to neither. drop everything when it happens. Yeah. It's it's so annoying. Yeah. <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> the best way to, to get that work is to make plans. Mm-hmm. And then the work will come in. You have to cancel it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, right. right. You, yeah, I, I know what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plan all the, my dreams. That's, that's my life. I mean, I plan my dreams and then, my, and then work comes in and I can't do them. That's, yeah, that's every day for me. Totes. And then when I'm when I'm actually free, I'm too stressed out to actually do anything. But no excuses. You got to just do it anyway. Totally. No crying. Right. You got to make the time. You'll find it. Um. Wow. <laughs> so let's before we run out of time. What are you angry about these days? What gets you angry? You're uh, on the short, bald, and angry podcast. Uh, You're allowed to yeah. get angry if you want. You can scream if you want. Oh, <laughs> double standards. And I, I think, 
Yeah, t- double standards is one of those things that really gets me because I'm hell bent on fairness and like and logic. So you know when people abuse power and you can't you can't when they say something to me like sexually harass me or something and I know I can't say that back. It's just it's so aggravating. Yeah, you got you got to be on your best behavior while these other people. Well, they will remain unnamed. Yeah, are, I'm uh, trying to make a name for myself right. in, a, in a man's industry, and uh, and also like, there's only so much I can speak up for myself because you don't want to be seen as that woman that sued their boss, right? So it's like you end up like blacklisting yourself essentially. Yeah, and at this point, I am close to getting into the union but not yet so uh you know i worked a job where one of the head uh electricians i by teaching them how to uh teaching everyone how to put out a burning person i put a piece of kevlar burning on my knee and they would put it out and then you know there's all these jokes like ha ha ha, i haven't touched a woman in 20 years like can i do that again and i'm like okay but then it just kept going and every time i'd (laughs) walk past him he'd be like tara right leg and like grope my leg and it starts funny and then it just gets bad huh yeah totally and i've i've had some really nasty things said to me completely out of the blue by my bosses and i'm like hey that's not okay and then i stopped getting calls for work and everyone's like, well, just sue them. And I'm like, I will, that is not how you get into the union. <laughs> Plus suing costs a ton of money. It's ridiculous. When people say just sue, I'm like, have you sued? Do you, are you a suer? How much money do you have? Do you know a lawyer? <laughs> yeah, that's another thing that makes me angry, right? It's just like, like someone is personally offended. They're like, I'll see you in court. It's like, do you even know what that means? Plus with Trump, Trump I, don't, I want to be the opposite of everything Trump represents. It's like, mm-hmm. I don't want to sue everybody. Everybody that upsets me, that's stupid yeah totally like fucking spoiled brat yeah let's fucking like call a spade a spade yeah. if you did something wrong just fucking admit it yeah and move on like production talk i uh i'm a pretty nice guy i don't mess with women and i don't really see i haven't really been in any situations where i have to stick up for anybody but then i'll find out like like after i walked away like something just happened you know on a job it's like i just missed this this ridiculous thing that i you know if i was confronted with it i'd like to think i would stick up for the woman, but who knows? It's tense, and it's like, yeah, work environments, all kinds of weird social and political and power dynamics yeah. are in play, and you just kind of got to play along sometimes. But I like to, I like to stick up because I, I'm, I, I speak up. Yeah. And yeah. When, as a guy, I can. It's, it's the the male white white male privilege that I have. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to use my power for good. Oh, uh, those guys. If I have any. Those guys who are like, can I even talk to women now? <laughs> that is a lame-ass if, joke. If yeah, no, no. If you have that, to ask that question, don't. Don't look at them. Don't talk to them. Just leave us the fuck alone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let me park my van. Let me pump my gas. Let me do my job. Don't fucking talk to me. Yeah. <laughs> that would be great. Yeah. yeah. Or, or get a clue. And then, yeah, you can talk. You could, you could say... You could say all kinds of things. Just be fucking nice about it, right? Be decent about it. Don't yeah. be, don't don't put don't make people feel super uncomfortable, right? Totally. Yeah, yeah. And also, I I just feel like there has to be accountability. And like, when a woman says like, "Hey, you're making me feel uncomfortable," like there has to be the, the guy has to just own up mm-hmm. and fucking move on. And but what I see happen and. Maybe they own up and they pretend to move on, but then the woman loses opportunities, mm-hmm. and it's it's just unfair. Like, yeah, it seems all good in the moment, and then you just yeah. If I the can, phone line goes dead. I want to be called out if I'm doing something wrong at work, especially if it's safety. Of course. And like, and if I'm new, inexperienced, learning, whatever, like, go ahead, yell at me if I do something wrong, and I want to learn and I want to get better. But, like, to cut down someone's career just because they defended themselves is, like, is why it's a male-dominated industry. It, it's just, like, any time a woman talks back, she's not hireable. Mm-hmm. So, like, what kind of recourse is there? You just have to let it happen. And the, and the worst thing about that is that, like, men who are, you know, st- gro- you know jokingly groping... 
or or have a sick sense of humor and and make a comment or whatever like they're warming up the pan like mm -hmm. it's going they're going to keep warming it up right and eventually something's going to catch fire yeah yeah they're just they're they're trying to they're they're priming their victims mm -hmm. and it's sick and sadistic and like i i think if someone calls you out on your shit you should say thank you <laughs> like that's how you should deal with it yeah that's that's awesome Totally. Just man up. Yeah. And say thank you and learn. Yeah. And, and be a decent human being. Walk away with your tail between your legs and then get over it. Yeah, we're all emasculated now anyway. It ain't, it ain't no thing. <laughs> get over it, man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Welcome to where I start. <laughs> <laughs> right. There's no shame in it. Yeah. Um, have you seen that movie, The Eagle Huntress? The documentary, The Eagle Huntress? No. You'd really like it. Okay. Is it like a Netflix documentary or? I don't know. It might. No, it's not on Netflix. I forget how we saw it. But yeah, it's about a girl, little girl in Mongolia. A very little girl who decides to become an eagle huntress. And that's a male dominated thing for centuries. It's like, it's pretty mm -hmm. awesome. There's all these like ain't, like old elders sitting around. And they're, they're like, yeah, a woman belongs in the kitchen. And then it's just cutting back and forth between all of them. And they, you know, that's like sc scattered over the whole movie. And then she fucking beats all of them in the end. True story. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, fear and anger, being scared. Are you, are you afraid of much anymore? You've over, you've had to overcome some serious fears. And one of them was not just the fire, but walking into the fire department to become friends with all of them. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Start making it legal instead of doing it illegally. Going to the authorities and saying, by the way, I've been illegally running a fire school. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that turned out great. And uh, it's, it's a great anecdote for me to share with people about confronting your fears, for yeah. sure. I mean, I still have a fear of continuing to live as hand to mouth as I do right now, forever. Yeah. You know? I have a fear of not being able to pay rent. Yeah, it's um, pretty scary. That's just New York. Yeah. It goes in waves. I don't know how it is for you. For me, I'm like, one day I'm fine. Next day I'm fucking, like, almost crying. Yeah, yeah. Or if not actually crying. Yeah. Or you get a gig that's, like, so good, and, like, you're like, from now on all my gigs are going to be making this kind of money. Like, oh, and then... The worst is when you get that gig, and you're like, oh, I'm good, I'm set, and then it falls through. <laughs> or, like, <laughs> or they cut it in half or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I was just about to go have a great dinner. You know, I was really, I was going to enjoy tonight, and now I can't. Yeah. Or, or I did, I enjoyed last night, and I shouldn't have. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Totally been there. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I guess I we all have fears. I'm not fearless, but, uh, yeah, I still, like I said, I'm at the ceiling of, of being a fire performer, and I'm still at the first rung of the ladder as a, as a pyrotechnician, so... I, there's a fear of kind of being pushed out of that world mm -hmm. because of male ego and and union bureaucracy right. and working together yeah. <laughs> to just screw me. Um, you know, there's that like uh, the fear of security, job security. Yeah, getting old. I don't want to. I don't want to be scrappy anymore. Yeah, it's hard. What, what does our future... As creators, what, where does our future take us? It's scary. Yeah. Um, do, you, uh, do you consider yourself to be flourishing right now? Or, yeah, yes yeah? and no. No? Yes and no. Like, um, I have a prospective job lined up for winter, and then I will be full-time special effects technician for a Broadway play. So I just have to keep playing my cards right with that. Yeah. And... But then I will I will feel like I've made it, and um, but you know I've I'm one of those people that I'm always like one license away and one gig away from finally making it. I think so. <laughs> I think there's there's always cool things that could happen with fire, and I think a lot of people want to use it. They just don't know how to do it. And what can happen? Yeah. Yeah. Tara's the person to go to if you're thinking about doing fire. You got to get in touch with Tara. Yeah, we'll, we'll... In New York City. We'll light fires in your venue. Yeah. Just, just put it in writing that you're okay with it. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, it's 4.51. How are we doing on time? Do you have to get going soon? I gotta go run and do safety. Let's uh, let's close it out with that. Uh, can you give any advice to creative people? Young, old, anybody? Um, don't take no for an answer. You know... We're about uh, to run over to the house of yes. Is that... Do they call themselves that? Not just it's like a movie reference, but also the concept of just... Yes. Say yes to We're everything. We're going to do it. Yeah, totally. Especially in the creative 
creative industries where so many people will tell you no. Totes. If, if you want to, uh, if you want to make it, you gotta, you gotta uh, go all out. It's the fire department. You gotta go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hello? And that's what it's like hanging out with Tara McManus. Good, how's it going? <laughs> the fire department calls and she has to go. Oh uh, yeah, I'm walking there right now. <laughs>